there is a general trend out there in the market that UK does not have enough jobs. UK does not have jobs. UK does not have jobs. In this video, I have Farhoon with me who has helped multiple international students get jobs in the UK. So he will be decoding the entire UK job market. What all international students need to know if they're planning to come to UK and what all are the mistakes international students do. So if you're planning to come to UK, make sure to watch this video till the end. And if there are any questions that you want to ask me or Farhoon, go to the comment section, put your questions there and we will be answering all of those questions so sit back and relax and make sure you tell us what you think about this video i've gotten every job every business opportunity because of following up multiple times opens the doors for all of these top jobs right now i'm here in canary wharf which is the financial district of london what your background is and what you're applying for i should see that within a few seconds i shouldn't be spending more than that you haven't got time my friend get to the point quick fast Sarun, i wanted to understand from you what do you think about the job market right now in UK? I hear on the internet that there are no jobs, no jobs. Every student hears that. So what do you think about? Are there jobs in UK? There's many jobs in the UK, man. It's all about sourcing the right jobs. So, I mean, I've seen from experience that most students are not really aware of like how to source the right jobs. You're just applying for any and every job. If you source the right jobs, there's enough jobs in data analytics, um, sales as well. So yeah, there's enough jobs here. It's more about like sourcing them effectively. What do you think students are doing wrong? when they're applying because all over the internet you can see so many reels people saying no jobs no jobs what do you think students are doing wrong great question i get asked this a lot so i'll just summarize this in the three points the first biggest mistake they're making is they're applying too late so usually most indians and pakistanis and you know international students they come here they they move here they got you know they study the degree they have fun and then after they graduate they start applying big big mistake never ever do that that's the first mistake they make second mistake is once they're applying they're applying for any and every job my friend you've got a business degree you're applying for data you're also applying for marketing you're also applying for sales you're also applying for banking you're never going to get a job that way you need to have clarity on the jobs you're applying for third biggest mistake is so they apply they finally figure out okay i want a banking job and they apply and they apply and they forget about it and they never ever follow up you're never ever going to get a response my friend if you apply for a job and you don't send emails and messages out to people in the company hiring managers and other employees in the company you need to follow up multiple times for each job that you apply to so these are the three biggest mistakes i, I see students make from my experience how often do you see students not following up oh my god man way too often i think 95 percent of students that speak to me um they say for when i applied for the job i haven't heard back i was like when did you apply they say i applied 10 days ago and then i'm like okay cool have you followed up since then they're like no but they haven't got back pretty much every student especially the ones from india and pakistan they apply and they just expect the employer to get back to them. Pretty much everyone applies and doesn't follow up to answer your question. They don't understand the power of follow-ups. I've gotten every job, every business opportunity because of following up multiple times. It's what literally would, a superpower. What would be the best way to follow up? Well, you should follow up at every stage of the application process. So you should follow up the day you apply. So send a message to the hiring manager on LinkedIn. Also send an email as well. Then what I tell my students to do, I've helped over 50 people get jobs over the past 15 months or so. I get them to follow up once every five days for 25 days. So follow up five times within a month of applying for every job that you apply to. And I get my students to also track all of their applications on an application tracker on a Google sheet so that you're on top of each application. So considering someone is planning to come to UK, does having work experience help them? How important is having work experience? 100%. I'd actually caveat then I'd say relevant work experience really helps you. Okay. So like every student I've seen got a job that's come from India, let's say Sanskriti, for example, she got a job in this international um, education company as a marketing executive. She worked exactly as a marketing executive in this international education company that was based in India. So if you've got a work experience and it's relevant, bingo, you're going to get a job. But even if you haven't got relevant work experience, but you've got some work experience and you can still talk about the transferable skills in the interview, you're still better off than someone with no experience. So to answer your question, work experience is very, 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 very important and really helps uh, when you're looking for jobs here in the UK. So if someone is planning to come from India to UK, right now they probably have five or six months left and or probably they're in UK right now. So what are some of the skills that you would recommend a person to pick up? Great question. So there's two types of skills that every student needs when, you know, when they're looking for graduate jobs. One is soft skills and one is hard skills. I've seen students lack both, right? Hard skills, I've seen us from Pakistan and India, we usually pick them up either at university or other two courses, but soft skills are the ones that we are missing out massively. So what I mean by soft skills is, can you communicate effectively? Can you work in teams? Can you collaborate? And can you deal with the 
different type of stakeholders. It's more of like when when I say soft skills, I mean how do you deal with people? And most Indians are really good at dealing with people back home, but as soon as they get here and Pakistanis as well, for some reason we just can't relate with the average person in Europe or in England. We need to be able to feel comfortable around them and make them feel like we will be part of the team and not be awkward. So like a really small example of soft skill is can you build report on a call? So whenever you jump on a call or you jump on an interview call which is over Zoom in England, usually first few minutes are report building and they're kind of small talk. So in England, obviously it's sunny now. People love talking about the weather. So if I were to jump on a call with anyone that's based in England, especially if they're in London, they're like, oh, wow, have you seen the sun? The weather's so amazing. The sky's so blue. It doesn't feel like England. It feels like, feels like Portugal. And like the first few minutes of a 30-minute call will just go, go about talking about the weather. That's kind of a skill on its own. That's building report. That's that kind of, that's building report. That's that's a soft skill. And most students lack that. Or if you're, so that's like on a Zoom call. But let's say you're actually going to an event, right? In person. And you meet people there. Soft skills and like small talk is all about saying, oh yeah, I like your 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 hoodie there. Like my friend has the same. Do you get it from Cambridge? It's like that store in Cambridge. It's like building that report. And most students that we usually have seen, a lot of us are very timid and we're very shy um, when it comes to actually bonding with Westerners. And you shouldn't really think that. You think like, we're here, we have an equal opportunity, we're just as good as them, and we should really focus on basically being likable. I teach my students to be likable, and usually I've seen my best students are the ones that are really likable. You know, if I really like working with them, they're usually really good at um, you know, impressing employers as well. So very important that you understand the importance of soft skills and being likable, because that's what's going to get you hired as a graduate, you know, because most of you guys are freshers that are watching this right now. At this same point, so let's suppose someone is studying right now in the UK, he's completed his education. How do you think that person can stand out? Like he is planning to apply for jobs. How can he stand out? So this person has already graduated from a UK university. He's right now graduating or graduated. Yeah. I mean, one way to definitely stand out is to actually build a person brand on LinkedIn. And I'm actually doing a masterclass on this over the weekend, but I've seen my students who have been the easiest to get into jobs were the ones that were active on LinkedIn. They would get many interviews. Because think of it, when a company in the UK gets an application, they look at two things, two CVs. One is the the old school CV, the one page or two page or PDF. The second thing they look at is the candidates LinkedIn. I've been in recruitment for full time a year and a half. When I was recruiting graduates for these tech companies, I would look at both their CV and LinkedIn. So you're just based off of your LinkedIn. If you can make posts that get, get garners attention, um, that are high quality, that provide value, it shows you're a person that can actually be valuable to people at scale. So like Murad has like over half a million followers and like millions of people get value from Murad's um, content. That is a skill itself. And I don't think Murad would ever, ever struggle if he were to apply for a job in the UK purely because that's his personal brand online. That exists, right? So... I recommend students as well. That's one way to stand out. There's many ways, but I think in this digital age, LinkedIn has also got a very generous algorithm. Um, like Instagram is pretty hard. So make use of it. And also LinkedIn, the bars will lower as well. 30K on LinkedIn is like 300K on Instagram because like there's not many people with like, you know, 30K. It's kind yeah. of like easier as well to stand out. I'm pretty sure you see so many resumes in a day. What mistakes do you see in a resume? First mistake I see is, Obviously, most CVs that I see are for freshers or people looking for graduate jobs. So they might have some experience. So first mistake is they mostly have three to four, four page CVs. Huge red flag. You're applying for entry level job. Your CVs should not be more than one page max. Second and very easily avoidable mistake is grammar mistakes and punctuation mistakes and formatting errors. Just bad hygiene on your one piece of paper that matters the most. Takes one hour to fix all the errors. Yeah, and if you're lazy, you can get take it to your smartest friend and get it fixed. So I see that a lot. So first is long CVs. Second is formatting and grammar mistakes. And the third reason is lack of clarity. Like, are you what job are you applying to, my friend? Why is why have you got six lines at the start with a professional summary that says motivated and energetic individual who loves spearheading themes and cross function environments? Literally in two lines, you can say, I'm a recent graduate, uh, or you can say, I'm a recent finance graduate from King's College London, looking for finance analyst roles, the right to work in the UK. That's two lines. That's what I get my students to write in their summary. And they usually get over like five interviews in one month, just by like a very short, crisp, direct to the point summary. So if it's not clear by looking at your summary and your experiences, what role you're applying for, then my friend, your CV is a waste of time.
because I've spent eight seconds and I don't even know what you're going for. You can really clearly see the CVs my students have. It's very clear that looking for finance analyst role, roles, worked in this investment analyst, worked in this finance analyst role, has got this CFA, has got this MSc in finance, very clear why they're applying for it. It needs to be very clear and coherent. What your background is and what you're applying for, I should see that within a few seconds. I shouldn't be spending more than that. You're, you haven't got time, my friend. Get to the point quick, fast. At this point, I want you to think about it for a second, but I want you to tell some stories about your current students and put them in a bracket where this was what they were doing wrong. And when they oh. corrected this, this happened. I want you to give me actual oh, if you have any story. I love that, man. I, I've got like a, a, a perfect story. I've got the story of Aisha, who's from Pakistan. She had a four paid CV. She went to Russell Group University and she came to me. She said, Faroon, I'm not landing any interviews. I've been applying for like almost a year. And I was like, Aisha, you go to a top university. How have you not landed an interview? She's like, I don't know. Have a look at my CV. I saw her CV. She had a four page CV with purple and like black and light gray colors. And it was absolutely horrendous. We so fixed you, you it. Have to fix it. Fixed it to one page, fixed the formatting, changed the colors, only you had black, that's it. Um, and she went from zero interviews in a year to three to four interviews in her first month. And the first company she actually landed into interview with, she got a job at, Ooh. World 50. And her base salary is like 30 something K now, she got promoted. And she, with bonus, she's walking with 50K in her first year. That's how powerful really? it is, how you're like, you fix your CV. That's yes. one example, right? Aarti, another example from India. She's from Mumbai, she worked at the big four, and oh, she had she had, a two she had experience in Mumbai at, at the big four in India. And now she didn't want to work in the big four or accountancy. She, she wanted to work in a client facing role. We changed her CV and we highlighted all of her client facing experience that she did in India, the big four. And then she landed 25 interviews in one month and she got to five final rounds. And eventually now she's in a junior account manager role. Where she travels the UK, she's also going to Europe or across Europe in March and April. So this month she's going to be going Amsterdam and stuff as well. Um, and she was struggling for like six months to even land interviews because she was applying for client facing roles, but her CV didn't really show these are right. She was the right fit for client facing roles. So as soon as we made it clear that she worked in sales roles and account manager roles and client facing roles, she started getting interviews. It's all about relevance, right? You can have all the big four experience on your CV. But if you're applying for client-facing roles, they don't care. Similarly, you could have all the client-facing experience on your CV and your and and if you apply for the big four, they won't care. So it's all about a game of relevance, right? So um, you, and Arthi's killing it right now. She's got a really good salary as well. So you think uh, right now the biggest mistake that students are doing is only pertaining to the resume? What do you mean by that? Is there any other mistake? Let's suppose a person has perfected their resume. If they're still not getting interview calls, what would you recommend to that? Like, it's a picture perfect resume. What do I do in that? Yeah, case? so I'm not getting interview calls. I mean, great question, man. Great question, Murad. You're very good. Uh, very, very good at like. I'm so sorry for getting. Really no, don't worry, man. I mean, actually, it's a great question because it's good that you asked it. Because let me just clarify that CV is one part of your application uh, material. So there's your CV, then there's your cover letter, then there's your outreach strategy. You can get. Two of them right out of three, you still might not get an interview. There's some instances where you get everything right, you still not get an interview invite. So you got to get everything right consistently. Can you tell me a bit more about your so, outreach strategy? So when I say outreach strategy, you got to be connecting with the exact person or the hiring manager that's in charge of the role that you're applying for on LinkedIn. And I tell my students not just to reach out on LinkedIn, but also get their email using Apollo, which is if there's many prospecting tools, you can get it for free and also send them an email with your cover letter within 200 words. So if you send an email and a LinkedIn message and you send your application in, and then you follow up once every five days, you're either going to get a rejection or an interview. And remember, a rejection is also a win because at least Wait you're not in limbo, way better than not knowing. And what do you think about starting a business in UK? You started a business in UK. How, what, how was the experience? I think UK is very, very business friendly. I think um, if you want to start a business, in the world, UK is one of the most friendliest places ever. It takes one hour to incorporate your company. Completely um, one hour. Tax, everything, everything. One to two hours. I mean, you get the documentation done in one, one hour. And then by 24 hours, your name is on the government website. So it, literally, that's how fast it was for me. And it costs like 
20 pounds if you go for a really cheap service or 100 pounds, depending on the address you get. But I was up and running within 24 hours of getting my company name registered with the UK government. That's how fast it is. Very, very business friendly. Honestly, I'm also planning to set up my company in UK. So this okay. actually helps a lot. Uh, okay. In terms of uh, people who are getting jobs, are there any specific qualities you feel like are different from people who are not getting jobs? I think I touched on this a second ago, man, but sadly, it's not all about the hard skills. Most people that get the jobs are likable. They have the soft skills. 99%, I'd say, 95% are the people who are likable and they train themselves up as opposed to people who are already trained up, but they're not likable. UK employers, they hire, especially at the graduate level, if they're hiring an international student, they're hiring them most likely because they like them and they like their attitude. Obviously, you have to be competent, but if there's one thing that's more important out of your personality and your hard skills, it's personality. For graduate roles, obviously, if you're going for a director role, then your experience is much more relevant. But if you're going for if you're a fresher, going for entry level roles, they're going to train you up anyway. So they're going to only they're they'd rather train someone up they like than get someone in that they don't like that's trained up. So listen to that again, guys. Repeat that in your head ten times. And what do you think is the best way to reach out to employers? I mean, obviously biased because I obviously. My, I live on LinkedIn. I would say LinkedIn, the best way, because every employer, when they think of getting talent, they think of LinkedIn. And when they post a job advert on the internet, it's usually on LinkedIn. So they're going through their DMs to see which applicant messages them. So the best way would be LinkedIn. Second best way would be email, but definitely wouldn't recommend Instagram or, um, yeah. or YouTube or whatever, you know, LinkedIn or email, but number one, LinkedIn. And also make sure when you're messaging on LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile is optimized. So your picture is, your head is in it mostly. It's in the center. The background is clear. There's no grammar or English mistakes or punctuation mistakes on your whole profile. Your education is laid out properly. I have a whole LinkedIn masterclass. I can send it to you guys, but very important that your LinkedIn is very high quality. No little mistakes that you make on your CV. Because if you have little mistakes, you're not going to get a response. And it's probably because they looked at your LinkedIn. They wasn't, they weren't impressed. Now I'm going to ask you the most important question. How do we land a sponsorship job? Ooh, the million dollar question. So there's two ways to get a sponsorship job. The first way is to get it right after graduating. And the second way is to get on the graduate visa, the two-year graduate visa, work at a company for a year, year and a half, and then transition to a skilled worker visa, sponsorship visa. Most people follow route number two. Only a small minority get sponsored right off the bat. And the reason is you'd only get sponsored right off the bat if you're going for engineering roles, data roles, or if you're mid or senior level. So 90% of students have to get a job, work in it, and then earn sponsorship through their hard work and dedication. And it's this sounds like risky because most people are like, but for me, what if I join the company and they don't sponsor me and I work with them? That's a risk you got to take. You need to believe in yourself that you're going to add so much value that they're going to be desperate to sponsor you. And I've seen many cases of students from India who joined companies at 21, 22, and they've worked so well that the companies are now getting sponsorship license just to sponsor them. And that sponsorship license would then lead to PR because you're going to get them sponsored for five years, three years, you know? So very important that you understand that it's very possible to start on the graduate visa and then down the line within two years, get sponsored. What was your question again? Sorry, go on. What, what are some of the hacks that you would give a person probably join some hacks. sort of, you know, some other sort of company? <laughs> hacks are, I mean, a hack I can give you based off of eight international students i would say it doesn't have to be a startup but a small and media sized company or a startup so difference between sme and a startup is startup grows really fast usually tech companies um since they're growing so fast they would rather pay the six to ten k to retain you so keep you in the company by sponsoring your visa then going out back in the market hiring someone and training them up and then you know living with the risk of them not being good enough and leaving and also startups are smart right they get international students in generally because they're a good deal and they yeah, know that even after sponsoring, like a smart agreed, agreed they're a good deal you get like you get talent that's worth 80k or 100k that a british would take you get them for like 50 percent or a fraction of the price right so it's actually financial and it's a good financial decision to hire international students from the employer's front but most employers see it as too risky to make because the investment so like the international no. students will leave that and also they also feel like they wouldn't fit in culturally. That's what I've heard. They feel like the biggest mismatch is cultural fit. And especially London, they will hire loads of international people. But usually the international people 
will be very like westernized and like went to international schools and, think about cultural you know, fit like how could a person fit into the culture because i've seen indian students when they go to uk they'll stick with indians in fact to a next level if gujarati student goes to uk he wouldn't yeah. meet indians he would stay with gujaratis if a, a student from punjab is going he'll stay with punjabis what do you think in that case and where did you live the truth is you're right i've seen this with uh, most international students that come here like at i went to the university which is i went to front regard it's well known for engineering and, and finance and in our course over there we had 150 students and we had like five six indians five six pakistanis five six malaysians five or six greek people five seven french people and then some chinese 10 20 or so chinese and the truth is guys that we all were in our own pockets we only mingled with each other and we spent 3 years together we didn't even we just see each other we won't even speak to each other so but i've seen the best students were the ones that were trying to mingle so i realized that the best students who were at jp morgan at goldman sachs at kpmg deloitte in venture capital private equity they'd be mingling a lot with other people that were from international background so i saw that when i'd come to london for networking events so bear in mind bath is like 100 miles west of of uh, london similar to how oxford is like 100 and something miles north of london and um i'd come here and i'd see like the mingling of like how people are very comfortable with international people and people from different backgrounds and i brought that back to my university and that's why in the first few years i was only with first year is only with pakistanis second year pakistanis and a bit of indians from delhi third year i was like i want to keep my friends i don't want to get rid of them because they're they're fun and i enjoy spending time with them and we help each other and we have a good family like environment but i also want british friends so okay. you, um, during my degree in second year i got close to a chinese guy but he was kind of very british because he li- moved here when he was 12 and when he moved here when he was 12 he made loads of british friends he had no chinese friends and he was like hey mate i've got a spare room in my house um i want you to move in with us and that was a game changing year of my life i moved into that house i had four british people that i lived with three british people and one this chinese half british because he was there for so long and i honestly like my whole understanding or the way i bonded with british people changed it's i just got so good at it. i understood what their jokes were understood how they think understood how they hang out what they do before they go pub what they do when it's a friday their whole mindset around how they think then on a personal level i could connect with them cuz i started humanizing them this is one of the biggest advice that i give to students that as soon as you land there don't be in that silo don't make indian friends only in fact that's the worst thing that you can be doing you can have them you can friend or two there but you're going there to have a new experience you're going there to have a new life at least make sure that the connections that you're making are cross borders and when i say cross borders that does not mean pakistan bangladesh that means everyone other than the people who you've already been surrounded with but yeah exactly 100% So may I'm 100% make Indian Pakistani friends but try and get people from across the world as well South Americans oh, yeah. American people British people trust me you learn so much more about not just them but yourself as well because you realize how different your culture and you are and yeah. it's crazy how especially for in a city like London or New York or Sydney where it's very international especially London and New York you realize that holy shit there's a lot of flaws we have in our cultures similarly there are flaws as well and we, we all know the cultural differences are on like how people eat how people wash and clean and sometimes they're true as well but similarly you also realize how we're different as well you know our hygiene might be different to people in the west and it's important to like see that to understand their perspective it's not racism it's you know it's usually rational thing you know okay so before i close it before i wrap it up i wanted to ask you one question uh what do you think if i if you had to rank it from 0 to 10 0 being i would never visit I would have never taken this path again of coming to UK studying and then getting a job and starting a company to 10 being oh this was the best decision of my life honest opinion 0 to 10 what would you rank it 10 without a doubt why is there so much neg- negativity on the internet why are there so many reels that come on my feed i imagine there's negativity around people not getting jobs and you cannot being a good place to come that kind of stuff right yeah truth is it's hard to get a job but it's also the fact that people aren't really using the right strategies so their cvs aren't formatted properly they're applying for any and every job then they're not following up then when they land interviews they don't research the company they don't research the interviewer they sometimes join from their phone um they can't build rapport they're making mistakes at every stage of the funnel of the application process and then they're saying i'm not getting a job 
So yes, it's harder now compared to when I graduated five years ago or so, but I'd like to reiterate my point that there's still hundreds of Indians and Pakistanis and Bengalis getting jobs every day in this country. They came from exactly where you are, so it's excuses. It's harder, but it's still possible. In fact, if you look at it, it's harder. Also, the people that are now getting jobs, usually they're so good that they end up getting sponsorship and then PR. So think of it as it's harder, but the outcome is better as well. And also now with the all of these global visa schemes, like the UK has introduced a high potential individual visa scheme, and the Australia has one as well, and Ireland has one as well. Even if you work for in the UK for two years and you don't end up getting a license, there's so many opportunities to move laterally to other first world countries like Canada or Australia or Ireland or New Zealand or Germany that you will be better off than if you stayed back home from a pure financial standpoint. And obviously your mental capability wise, you'll be a completely different person because you've met so many different interesting people. So yeah, to answer your question, there's a lot of hate on the internet for people that come to the UK, but the truth is there's a lot of success stories as well. And I see them day in, day out. I feel like success stories uh, don't scream so much. And negativity, yeah, negativity. negativity attracts like this. If someone posts there are no jobs and everyone is like, oh shit. And they start panicking. But then someone is getting a job after a degree. They're like, oh yeah. I mean, he did a degree. He deserved a job. So no one's talking about the success stories, but everyone is talking about the negative stories. As a result, you just feel like that's because many of my students have also ended up finding jobs. So it isn't like there are no jobs, but the yeah. negatives are way much more louder. 100%. The truth is that it's easy to not do the right things and not get a job. And it's hard to do the right things and get, and get a job. With hard and difficulty comes big reward as well. Depends on are you willing to put in the fight through the Yeah, are you willing to put in the effort to get the big outcome? I'm not sat here on the ninth floor of this beautiful building with all these banks around me because it was easy for me. You know, it was hard. And I'm sat here in my office as a business owner because I worked hard for it. So anyone can achieve what I've achieved. I don't think it's impossible, but I do think it's hard. But it's like anything in life, anything worth getting is hard. Let's leave it at that. But thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for taking out the time. Seriously. It actually no worries, man. I really enjoyed this. You know, I actually loved having this conversation with Faroon because generally what happens is there is a general consensus that the market is really bad, but no one is talking about the good side of it. And while making my decision, I'll keep in mind that UK still has a one year master's degree, which can be better because in two years master's degree, you'll be out of the workforce for two years. In UK, you'll be out of the workforce for one year. You'll get a two year post study work visa. That also is interesting. Next thing would be UK has some of the best universities in the world and is also known to give out scholarships. So all these points considered, UK can still be a very attractive destination and considering that the cost of studying in UK since it's just a one year degree can be lower than studying in US or any other country. What is right now happening is if there is a student who goes to UK and finds job, they don't talk about it because it's normal. They went there to study, look for jobs, got the job. They don't talk about it. But when someone goes and does not find job, they talk about it a lot. As a result, you get to hear the negatives. You don't get to hear the positives, which there are. Most certainly people are getting jobs in UK. To add to this discussion, I would also want to say that I will be moving to UK also in this September only to study. Yes, this is the first time I'm saying this live on camera. But the thing is, there are jobs right now in UK, in USA, in every country. But for people who are not working on their skills and are not applying for jobs in a correct manner, obviously there is a correct manner to apply for jobs. They're not finding jobs anywhere, not even in India, not even in UK. So the thing is, you have to make sure that your profile is good. You work on your profile, you learn skills, you make your resume in a good way, you reach out to companies in a perfect way and that's why all these educational videos are very important for you now if you're planning to come to uk watch this video in which i talk about top 10 universities of uk all 10 universities of uk here this video click 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 click